Okay, we have for us a recommended vote of the board of select the select board on Article Five. Uh, I think Mr. Um, uh, um, excuse me, Mr. Hurd. Yep. Did you wish to speak to this? Yep, briefly. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Hurd, Chair of the Select Board. This is an article authorizing the Select Board to file home rule legislation as recommended by the Clean Energy Future Committee to amend the town bylaws to regulate the installation of new fossil fuel infrastructure in new residential and commercial construction and major renovations. The purpose is to take firm action to reduce dependence on fossil fuels and reduce pollution in Arlington. The Select Board voted in favor of po positive action four to zero with Mr. DeCourcy recusing himself from the discussion and the vote. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Hunt, um, Heard. Uh, Patrick Candlin. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I'm Pat Hanlon, uh, Precinct 5, and I appreciate the chance to introduce Warren Article Number 5. In a few seconds, Amos Meeks, the co-chair of Sustainable Arlington and not coincidentally a PhD candidate in physics at Harvard, will present the article to you in a video. I will have about 20 seconds to add after that to add a little additional information. Amos and I will both be available to answer questions and will be joined by Ken Pruitt, the town's energy manager and the chair of the Clean Energy Future Committee, the town body whose recommendation started the process that brings this article to you today. Thank you, sir. That's our first example of a video. Hello, my name is Amos Meeks. I'm a member of the steering team of Clean Heat for Arlington. And today I want to tell you about Warrant Article Number 5, which asks to file a home rule legislation that would allow the town of Arlington to create a bylaw amendment that would prohibit fossil fuel infrastructure in new construction and gut re renovations. First, some background on this bylaw. So our goal is to reach 100% clean energy by 2050. And this is mandated by both a state law, the Global Warming Solution Act, which commits us to reduce our emissions by 80% by 2050, and in 2018, when the Arlington Select Board voted to set a goal of net zero by 2050. Fortunately, the recipe for reaching 100% clean energy is relatively simple. We electrify everything and we green the grid. So if we look at Arlington's total emissions, we see that the vast majority of our emissions, about 60%, come from buildings, residential buildings and industrial buildings. And of this, the vast majority of this is space heating. So we wanna focus space on space heating as a place to start. Fortunately, electric solutions for space heating exist in the form of heat pumps. Heat pumps are very different from electric resistance heaters that you might um, think of, which are expensive and inefficient. Instead, they're more like an air conditioning unit that can heat as well as cool. And because they just move heat around, in terms of heating efficiency, they can be incredibly efficient, um, something like 200 or 300% efficient. In addition, cold climate air source heat pumps work in our climate. They're rated to be highly efficient down to five degrees Fahrenheit, and many of them work down to negative 17 or even negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit, and it simply does not get that cold around here. And they work as the sole source of heating. In 2017, a large portion of new homes in Massachusetts used a heat pump as the only source of heating and cooling. And even in Arlington, in Arlington there are many buildings that use heat pumps as their sole source of heating without backup heat. Heat pumps are also affordable. So this study in 2018 modeled a house um, being installed with gas and electric air conditioning compared to a, a house using an electric air source heat pump and uh, heat pump hot water heating. And what they found is that the installation cost differed by less than $1,000, which in the case um, that they were looking at of a large single family um, house, newly built, con newly constructed house, this difference, cost difference shown in this red slice here is tiny compared to the overall value of the house. In addition, they found a small difference in annual operating cost. But again, for a new 3,000 square foot home, if you look at the monthly expenses and compare that difference, which is this red sliver at the top here, it's pretty much negligible. So in the case of these large new, new construction single family houses, the difference in cost ends up being more or less a wash. 
But of course, some people can't afford to pay anything at all. Fortunately, affordable housing is already leading the way on heating electrification. These are some examples of buildings um, outside of Arlington that use heat pumps as their sole source of heating and cooling. But even within Arlington, all of the affordable housing construction projects that are being planned or built by the Housing Corporation of Arlington use heat pumps as their sole source of heating and cooling. And this is often because for the sort of um, high density, high efficiency new construction being built for affordable housing, heat pumps are just already the most economical option. So to get into what this bylaw actually proposes, we would prohibit new fossil fuel piping in new construction and gut renovations. This would not affect existing buildings that are not undergoing some kind of uh, gut renovation. It would not affect kitchen renovations or other sort of renovations that are not literally stripping the entire inside of the building down to the studs and rebuilding it. And it would not affect additions. We also include a number of practical and common sense exemptions. This bylaw would affect only the customer side of um, the fossil fuel piping. All gas cooking appliances are exempted. Backup generators are exempted. Since it deals with fossil fuel piping, it would not affect uh, propane fossil fuel cooking, such as uh, outdoor grills. Um, hot water for large buildings is exempted due to uh, technical reasons. Um, and in addition, research and medical facilities are exempted also due to technical reasons. And of course, uh, repair um, of existing and unsafe piping is exempted. And to be clear, this only affects fossil fuel piping. So any modifications can be done to the water side of a water heating system without this bylaw coming into effect. However, this may not um, account for all cases. And in, so in order to avoid any sort of undue expense or burden, um, anyone can seek a waiver for the bylaw and the waivers would be in, uh, granted by the building expense, uh, inspector, potentially with consultation with town staff and local energy experts. And finally, as a quick clarification, the reason this needs to be a home rule petition is due to conflicts with existing state law. So over the summer, the Attorney General Maura Healy found for a similar bylaw in Brookline that while she uh, strongly supported the policy of this bylaw, um, it does conflict and is preempted by existing state laws. However, home rule petitions are a very common way to deal with these kinds of, kinds of conflicts, as you can see in Articles 11 through 15 of this special town meeting. So with that, from me and everyone else at Clean Heat for Arlington, uh, we hope that you will join us in supporting Warrant Article Number 5, and we would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Mr. Moderator, if I can just do the last 20 seconds. Yeah. Uh, most of you, most of the members today received an email from Clean Heat for Arlington earlier today linking to a new study of the economics of electrification in a number of cities, including Boston. The new study shows a much narrower gap between gas and electric co in operating costs than the two-year study that Amos discussed in the video. Um, the new is dated from last October, and we did not really focus on it until uh, after the video was made. Uh, but the difference, according to the new study for major from 2020, is about 3% or, or 10% a month instead of the somewhat larger figure that uh, is talked about in the video. That said, we're ready to rest and, uh, and uh, Ken and Amos and I will all be available if there are questions uh, to attempt to answer them for you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. There's nothing further. Um, called Jim DiTullio, James DiTullio. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I'm honored to speak tonight in favor of Article 5 as a town meeting member and an appointed member of Arlington's Clean Energy Future Committee. I urge the strong endorsement of this article by town meeting tonight, which is consistent with the Clean Energy Future Committee's support for the article. Uh, you've heard from the article's sponsors about its details, who will affect and how it will do so. And my objective tonight is not to repeat what's already been said or to wade into the specifics of the article, except to say that it's been an exceptionally researched, studied and expertly drafted article representing the hard work of many dedicated Arlingtonians over many months. 
Uh, the article was drafted with precision and care, and I think it strikes the right note between its environmental ambitions and real world practicalities. Um, what I do want to speak to tonight is why this article is so critically important for town meeting to support at this moment in time. You know, one of the tired tropes of climate change deniers in recent years has been the opening phrase, well, I'm not a scientist, as if, you know, sort of saying, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know about, I don't know if climate change is real. Well, I'm also not a scientist. And that's precisely why I trust the scientists and researchers who've dedicated their lives to studying and documenting the climate crisis. Their research is undeniable. Our planet is sick and getting sicker by the day. And we're nearing the climate tipping point. And each day that we fail to act in any big or small way is not just a missed opportunity, but also brings us one step closer to a point of no return. And against that stark backdrop, we as leaders of Arlington's town government must take every available opportunity presented to us to do whatever we can to stop the del deleterious effects of climate change. To that end, the Clean Energy Future Committee, of which I'm a member, has been working diligently since 2018 to map a plan for Arlington to reach net zero carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. The net zero plan being developed by the CEFC relies on a three-part framework, make buildings more energy efficient, electrify everything, including buildings and transportation, and green the grid so that everything we've electrified is powered by clean electricity. Article five is ex absolutely necessary to the success of that plan, because let me be clear, every future building constructed that relies on fossil fuels will be in direct conflict with the net zero plan and the 2050 goal. Many people often think of 2050 as some far off date. It's, it's not, certainly not when we have a task in front of us of the magnitude of reaching net zero. The decisions, even the small ones that we're making today will have major repercussions for the next 30 years and will affect our ability to reach the 2050 goal. Think about it this way. We should not and simply cannot be building new buildings at this point in time in 2020 that are reliant on fossil fuels when those buildings have multi-decade lifespans. To do so is the equivalent of hobbling your leg right before you attempt to complete a marathon in record time. It just won't work. I realize that this article's future rests on a home rule petition, which became a necessity in light of recent opinions from the Attorney General's office. Arlington has the opportunity to be in the vanguard of this burgeoning movement. Although Arlington and Brookline are the first towns to push this issue, several other towns are close behind. I expect that in two years time, dozens and dozens of cities and towns will have joined the movement and filed their own similar home rule petitions on this issue. There's going to be strength in numbers and numbers of that size will assuredly get the attention of Beacon Hill leaders to either act on the petitions or take statewide action on their own. We've seen a similar strategy with plastic bag and polystyrene bands, which are now on the verge of statewide enactment. Arlington, Arlington can be a true leader on this issue if we act to support Article 5 tonight. So I'll conclude by simply asking you this question. Several decades from now, when your children or grandchildren ask you what you did to turn back climate change and to fight the existential battle of our lifetimes, what are you going to tell them? I, I think it's fair to say that if you support Article 5, you can tell them you began the longest and most important journey for humanity with a single important step in the right direction. Please support Article 5 and thank you for listening to me tonight. Thank you, Mr. Tulio. Um, just to remind town meeting members, please name and precinct when you oh, first sorry. log on. Thank Mr. you. Tulio, precinct 12. Thank you very much. Um, I'm called David Levy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Dave Levy from Precinct 18 and also a member of the Clean Energy Future Committee. Um, I will be brief because I know the hour is late. Um, so I just want to say that, you know, I joined the committee that uh, helped support this uh, warrant article uh, for your consideration because, you know, a few years ago when I joined the committee, I just kept getting more and more concerned about how every summer felt like it was getting hotter and I was running the air conditioner more and, you know, shoveling the snow less. And I remember as a kid growing up in the Boston area, how, you know, every once in a while it was a big deal with the family would gather together and sleep in one room where we had one air conditioner running. And now you'd be crazy um, to think that was gonna be a reality going into the summer of 2021. I mean, unfortunately we were just facing every year more and more days of 
90 degrees, you know, 90 plus, and it's frightening. Uh, I have two young kids. Uh, they're both in public schools and I worry about their future uh, when they are adults and what it will look like and will they be able to do the things that we're able to do or will weather quite honestly prevent it. I, it just, it frightens me uh, to think of the world I'm leaving them. Um, so being a part of this committee has been so exciting because we're able to be practical about what can we do as a town to uh, start to make a change in this situation. Um, and this, quite honestly, we're working on several initiatives. We think they're all very practical. We hope to discuss those in the coming year. But this came before us because other groups were just as concerned. Um, and we realized we could do something now that would help. Um, it doesn't, you know, like we said, if you have gas today in your home, this doesn't change that. Um, if, you know, unless you are planning some major renovation of your entire home, um, assuming the state follows our request, you know, your life will not change. But as we've said, it does send a signal. It does start the process to make change in this regard. I, I do believe that if we are going to improve the climate we live in, we must find ways to stop burning fossil fuels. It's, it's one of the solutions we have to approach. And, and this is one I think where, you know, over time we can ring fence the issue and get our arms around it more proactively. And I, I think it'll make a positive impact on our lives and our, our children's lives. So I would urge you to vote yes on Article 5. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about the Clean Energy Future Committee and what we're uh, up to. And I thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Ed Tremblay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Ed Trombley, Precinct 19. I had a few questions uh, and uh, a couple of comments. My comment is that uh, more than 20 years ago when I worked on electric cars, there was a move afoot back then to mandate them. And thankfully that didn't happen because they weren't quite ready for prime time at that time. You know, here 20 years later, electric cars are have become much better and you know what? People choose them and buy them on their own. And I would submit that that this is a, it should be the case with this too. Um, heat pumps are, are further along in in their uh, in their efficiency and and so on now compared to where electric cars were 20 years ago. But who's to say that we aren't going to have something better? Somebody somebody isn't going to invent a better refrigerant or, uh, or some new heating system that's, uh, that's more efficient. And um, this doesn't ban the, the, the piping in the house. You can still have gas heat. And, and depending on who you talk to or when they, uh, or, or who's presenting, you either can or, or, or don't or can't have gas hot water. Um, I know of people who have heat pump hot water heaters and uh, they've commented about how it makes their basement cold in the winter. And uh, so I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure that this is quite ready for prime time yet. Uh, another concern that I might have is that the, uh, the electric grid we have here in Arlington is not the uh, most robust thing in the world. Um, I know that at my house, I used to want, I'm at the end of the, uh, the, the line and when some neighbor up closer to the transformer from me would turn on their air conditioning, the, uh, the, the, the voltage at my house would drop down to uh, less than 100 volts. Well, that tra transformer blew up eventually, and uh, now we have a new one, so it's not quite so bad. But uh, Okay, Ed, circle back to scope. Um, the scope part of this is that I'm not sure that the, the without a major rebuild, that Arlington's grid can carry all the upcoming um, electric devices that, uh, that people would like to plan for this. Um, so I think that we ought to take a, uh, just let right now, let people make their own choices on what they want to heat their homes with. Um, and, I, and I think that as it, once the heat pumps become really good or we have something better, then people will choose them. And, and they, are, they are choosing them now, they're, they're, they're not bad. 
uh, but the the proponents here had a uh, had a little chart that showed the the cost of of uh, heat pumps versus gas installation. Well, there's a big difference in heat pump cost depending on whether you get a high efficiency one or one that's less efficient. As as you might guess, a less efficient one costs less. And the highly efficient ones are pretty expensive. So um, we do get cold weather here sometimes. And the efficiency of heat pumps is not the best when it's very cold out. So I would say that maybe maybe a hybrid system where you have both is, is, a, is a good way to do it. But for me, for right now, I think we ought to let people decide what they want to have for heat in their uh, heat, what they want to heat their houses with. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Trembley. Um, it's 11.59. I can either take one more speaker or we can take a motion to adjourn till Wednesday. So. Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. And we have a motion to adjourn till Wednesday, the 18th. Um, seeing no objections. Meeting is adjourned till Wednesday the 18th, at which time we'll pick up that the speaker list where we left off. Karen Kelleher, Precinct 5, thank you. Uh, I rise in favor of Article 5, the fossil fuel ban for new construction and substantial rehab, and I'd like to speak to it from the perspective of the affordable housing sector. I'm the executive director of an organization called Risk Boston. We provide financial policy and other kinds of support for affordable housing, as well as economic development, small business, and other aspects of community development. In that capacity, my organization has been providing policy support at the intersection of affordable housing and energy efficiency and climate resiliency for up to 10 years, almost 10 years now. Um, and in that uh, at that intersection, we're very focused on driving both, um, you know, reduction of um, fossil fuel use, but also controlling cost. Because when we're advocating for measures that reduce the carbon footprint of a building, if they are increasing the cost, they may be actually reducing the affordability of that project, reducing the numbers of units or reducing the uh, um, income level or increasing the income levels. So we try very hard to make sure that we're not pulling um, between those two objectives, but doing things that are moving both of them forward. So I wanna to speak to this article and what I like about it from that perspective. Um, my organization has been very supportive of this type of ban in Brookline and in other communities in Massachusetts because of some of the features of these bans that really make it a feasible, viable uh, thing to push forward in both affordable housing and other multifamily housing. Um, so there are two primary things I like about this ban. Um, first is that it focuses on electric HVAC systems. And that's a place where the market offers electric options that are cost effective. Uh, I couldn't say the same thing if this was a, uh, requiring hot water heaters to not rely on fossil fuels or emergency backup generators because the market hasn't produced those options yet. Um, but in the HVAC space, there are viable cost effective electric options. The second thing I like about this um, is that it has waiver authority if there were to be financial feasibility issues as a result of this um, imposition. And so there is a particular call out for affordable housing in that waiver authority. So should folks be concerned that this is imposing a cost on affordable housing that it can't bear that's gonna reduce its affordability. I think there's plenty of, um, of track record to show that that's not the case. And the last point I'll make is that that's being demonstrated right here in Arlington by the Housing Corporation of Arlington. I think it was pointed out on Monday night that they are currently constructing two different projects that are relying on all electric HVAC systems in their affordable housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Kelleher. Next will be Roderick Holland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, Roderick Holland, Precinct 7. Um, brief comment uh, on this article. Uh, I like it a lot because it gives us something for the gut rehabs and teardowns that otherwise are ca causing havoc. Uh, at least we get better greenhouse gas. 
emissions out of it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Gordon Jameson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. Um, in preparation for speaking tonight, I looked at the video again. Um, I think the article is positive. I'm positive on the article in general and well-crafted. Um, I have a question about what Ms. Keller just said, and then I have a couple more. Um, she mentioned that it only applied to HVAC and not hot water. Could that be clarified by someone? Uh, Mr. Meeks? Um, yes, so I think uh, it, it does apply to, it applies to fossil fuel piping. And so fossil fuel and piping, of course, would affect a hot water heater. So it does apply. I think she was referring specifically to the exemption for hot water in large buildings, buildings over 10,000 square feet. And that's okay. really where the technology does not exist. Thank you, Mr. Meeks. Um, the history of uh, this type of article goes to Brookline. Um, and uh, was that put, Mr. Meeks, was that put through the moderator, Mr. Meeks, was that a bylaw that passed town meeting? How was that passed initially? Mr. Meeks, can you answer that? Or Mr. Hine, actually Mr. Hine might be the better person. I, I believe it was passed by a bylaw in Brookline, but uh, Mr. Hine. Mr. Chairman, I this is Pat Hanlon, uh, Precinct 5. You can't just break in unless I call oh, on you, sorry. sir. He was, he was left on. I know. I, but, but you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Hamlin, Mr. you can't Moderator, just break I in unless I call you. on you. I did address to you. I, that, Pat, you can't break in unless I call on you. I, I'm the moderator. Gordon asked a question. I call on Mr. Heim to answer his question. Reclaiming we, my time. Isn't <laughs> Gordon, go ahead. Mr. I, 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 so um, I, Mr. Heim, is, is this a, a bylaw that was passed by Brookline? Mr. Heim. Douglas Heim, town council. Good evening, members of town meeting. Yes, the bylaw was passed by Brookline town meeting. The bylaw that Brookline town meeting passed was later uh, rejected by the municipal law unit of the attorney general's office. And I'd be happy to elaborate on that if folks would like. Um, I know that Mr. Meeks and Mr. Hanlon are also aware of those details, but I don't want to take up all your time, Mr. Jamison. So the answer to that is yes, it was passed by town, uh, a, town by a town meeting bylaw. Thank you. So um, am I correct, Mr. Heim, that bylaws usually require two thirds vote? Mr. Heim? No, uh, Douglas Heim, town council. So zoning bylaws require two thirds vote. An amendment to the general bylaws require a majority vote. Uh, unless Mr. Leone is correct me on that uh, score. I believe that general bylaw only True. requires a majority vote. This is not a zoning bylaw? No, sir. Why is it not? Why is it not a zoning bylaw? I'll defer to Mr. Heim on that. So, uh, Douglas Heim, Town Council. There's a couple of ways this particular uh, we could have approached this, but this is largely not the uh, exclusive to the province of zoning. We have a lot of other regulations that speak to um, certain. Uh, facets of private property regulation, including uh, buildings. I believe that this is proposed to be entered in under um, Title VI of the town bylaws, which does regulate um, certain aspects of buildings and makes reference to the state building code. So it, it does fit in there. I'd be happy to, I don't want to take again more of Mr. Jameson's time than necessary. But I'd be happy to talk more generally about the legal posture for any town meeting members who would like to know more and why and how we're planning to uh, approach the issue of uh, the Attorney General's office's uh, decision relative to Brookline's plan. I think I, I think I think thank you, Mr. Hyde. I think I understand the Attorney General's position. I did. I looked at the um, the video, and that's explained that. I just was confused that that this. Um, to my mind is a zoning bylaw, but um, I guess in this context, it's not because if it was a zoning bylaw, then this would be a way to work around to get a majority position versus two thirds. But I, I trust your your uh, knowledge, Mr. Hines. On other things, I was um, happy to see on page seven for those of who are following along on the paper copy we were sent that there's a difference between um, 
you need 75% of the existing uh, space to be changed for residential and a slightly lower for um, commercial. Um, it says added space. So in other words, a question for ha perhaps for Mr. Meeks or Mr. Hanlon, mm -hmm. um, if I added, if I doubled the size of my house, I wouldn't have to do this. Is that correct? Mr. Hanlon, now, now you can speak. That is, the, that is correct. The Thank you, Mr. Mr. Hanlon. Um, continuing on thinking towards the future when we're doing all doing this, um, I'm sure many of the proponents are against pipelines for natural gas. Um, I myself was against the Northern, um, Northern Pass, which would have brought, uh, for aesthetic reasons of the White Mountains, it would have brought uh, hydropower down from Canada. I'm concerned long-term about our um, supply here. Um, Mr. Uh, speaking quickly to Mr. Twemley's comments at the end of his speech, uh, I'm curious how much of this is already in progress. Um, if the director of inspections is online, could he report how many um, splits have been installed or permitted in the last 12 to 24 months? It's Mr. Um, Byrne present. Can we bring Michael up if he is? Uh, yeah, uh, good afternoon. Uh, good, good evening, Michael Byrne, PC 13, Inspector of uh, Inspectoral Services. Um, good. Now, we, we've not kept track um, of how many of these have been done, but I know that there has not been a lot of them so far. Okay. But, Thank you, Mr. Byrne. Thank you, I'm Mr. Trying Byrne. To get, just trying to get how, 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 how far this was being adopted um, already on itself. So it sounds like we need to have a little nudge here. So. Um, I'm, I'm moving towards being in favor of this, learning about the bylaw, you know, bylaw and, and that. And I wanna remind people very quickly that um, whether or not you need to have a split or something, the town has a way, and if you don't have solar on your house, the town has a way for your uh, electricity usage to tomorrow, essentially be 100% green. And that's the Arlington Community Electric thing. You can op opt up to the 100%. So I wanna put a pitch in for that. And so uh, while I, I admit I was initially uh, skeptical, I will be voting for this. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Jamison. Uh, Mr. Joshua Lobel. Hi there, Josh Lobel, Precinct 8. Um, I also am in favor of this article for many reasons. <clears throat> One is I think that we probably all can agree on the fact that climate change is real and that we have a limited opportunity to address uh, or mitigate all those problems. So one question we heard in our precinct meeting was why should Arlington take this up? It seems like a much bigger issue. Um, and I would agree it is a much bigger issue and probably it would be ideal if we had federal and state leadership on this, but we don't. <clears throat> and so Many towns and cities around the country are doing this. San Francisco just did the same thing with even a little bit more severe uh, impact because they also don't allow gas for cooking. Um, there are, I guess, about 39 or 40 places around the country, country that have done it. Um, so I think that, and unlike kind of just a symbolic move on our, our part, it also represents real opportunity because we're preventing building uh, structures and, and systems that are, will be obsolete and have to be changed. So that just kind of makes sense. Um, it's been mentioned several times that Brookline did pass this or a similar uh, article at their non-virtual town meeting. And originally, I think it had a fair amount of skepticism, but it ended up passing by a, a vote of 207 to three with their conversation there. So I think that again, at least at their town meeting, people felt fairly convinced by all the discussion. Um, the other thing is that by doing this, we're not really um, trying to force an industry so much. The, mar the technology is there already, it's improving all the time. And by putting in the, the kind of the core infrastructure to utilize this kind of technology, um, we can take advantage of it. Whereas if we don't do this and you build your house with, um, a system that's not compatible with a heat pump, then it does totally, it would have to be uh, replaced in order for us to do what we have to do by 2050. So I, again, I'm, I'm very supportive of this. I'm glad that Arlington is taking a leadership on it and I appreciate all the people who've put in the 
effort to get this on our agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lobel. Um, Mr. John Deist. Yeah, there I go. Okay. Um, John, you have to turn off Mary's right. speaker. Yeah. Oh, right. right. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, John. Oh, much better. Thank you. Um, I'm also strongly in favor of this. This is the great impending disaster for the entire world. And we, uh, our participation this way is a really good idea. So I'm strongly for this. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Christian Klein. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christian Klein, Precinct 10. Um, I'm a practicing architect in the Boston area. Um, the mechanical engineers who design the mechanical um, systems for the interior spaces we design um, switched about three years ago to go all going to air source um, heat pumps specifically for this reason, that any new infrastructure that's installed today, especially in the commercial side, which is not necessarily applicable to, to the bylaw we have in front of us, but everything will be most likely in place 30 years from now. And so if we are looking to reduce our emissions by 2050, we have to do it today. We can't do it 30 years down the road. So um, I am very strongly in favor of this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Um, Mr. John Warden. Mr. Warden, you can unmute yourself. Go ahead and talk, John. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Again. Oh, thank you. I couldn't find the unmute button. I, uh, I, I did it for you. Oh, 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 good. That's why I couldn't find it. Uh, yes. th thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, John Warden, Precinct 8. I also, like previous speakers, am strongly in favor of this. And I was particularly moved by Mr. Tulio's comments <clears throat> uh, Monday night uh, about the, the legacy we're leaving and, and what will your what will you tell your children and grandchildren when they ask you what you did about climate change uh, in that 2020? Well, in my case, it'd probably be great-grandchildren. My children have been involved in trying to deal with climate change uh, for a long time. But <clears throat> I, um, uh, I, the, uh, the uh, legislative process, I mean, we're gonna send this Hopefully we pass this uh, by a large majority. We will send it to the legislature and there it goes into kind of down the rabbit hole. <clears throat> and you can be sure that the, the gas industry, the oil companies and the, and the <coughs> development world. <coughs> Sorry. Yep. And the, the developers will have the best, the best lobbyist money can buy and if, if you've ever dealt with <clears throat> the legislature, you know that the lobbyists have a much better way of getting the ear of our legislators than we ordinary citizens do. <clears throat> but it is important for us at this point, I believe, to, and I'll uh, bring this all together, uh, to do whatever we can on the local level uh, to show that we are really serious about this climate change issue, which is so really an existential challenge to our society. And <clears throat> I just mentioned briefly uh, three things that we can do ourselves without any help from the legislature. One is stop the war on trees. Uh, the, the, the central administration of our town on half- well, John, let's, we're talking about fossil fuel right now. Let's keep it within scope. Well, I tied this together, Mr. Moderator. Okay. Be because- um, uh, um, the, the, the whole co concept is, say, is eliminating the 
additional use of fossil fuel. And part of that, if we stop cutting down all those trees, they wouldn't use those gas chainsaws uh, to, to uh, cut them down. And so, but, but the, Mr. Meeks in, in an earlier presentation that I heard talked about the importance of trees. That's also a part of climate control, which is really what we're dealing with, I mean, climate um, change. And the trees are putting out oxygen and stuff that, that, that helps us avert that. And so removing them is inimical. It's, it's, part, of the same, it's part of the same thing as eliminating fossil fuel, uh, getting, saving our tree canopy. The second is the pterodon ep epidemic, um, which again is uh, those aren't those aren't electric backhoes that are destroying those little affordable houses, and 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 carrying them off to the dump, and all the materials and so on, good wood that you can't even buy anymore is being destroyed to put up new buildings made of, of made of fo the same thing that makes fossil fuel, oil, <clears throat> uh, and and finally. Um, and this, uh, this is a very important point. The biggest and most expensive project ever undertaken in 385 years in this town has been the new high school. And one of the, one of the undertakings that was given to us at town meeting and was given to the voters, the new high school would be heated and cooled by ge geothermal. So it would not use fossil fuel except for cooking. Um, and, and then but af after the, those votes were obtained, and the thing was approved, they said, well, we're gonna not, can't do the geothermal. And, and I think that is a serious mistake that has to be reversed. Uh, that, and that's it's, it's a been, little bit out of scope there, John. Let's bring it back to the article. I'm trying to get rid of the fossil fuel going into the high school. I know, but that, but we're, we're not gonna solve the problems of the high school architecture no. issues tonight. We're talking about fossil fuel fee. I, the reason I bring that up, Mr. Moderator, please is that when we go to the legislature we, we 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 want to say we have done everything we can on the local level to to combat climate change climate change in, in our town and to be an example for the rest of the state and if they say well what about the high school that you that you use good old natural gas with uh, our, with our leaky pipes uh, you didn't change that did you well you look a little bit hypocritical I don't want them to be able to say that about us. That's not the kind of people we are. Let's do it right. Let's pass this, pass this, this, this warrant article, uh, send it to the legislature, and let's go in there with a clean slate and say we've done everything we can, trees, teardowns, high school, to, to uh, our level, to do our part for climate, to prevent climate, uh, mitigate climate change. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Uh, Sophie Magliazzo. Yes, good evening. So familiar, also precinct eight. Um, I am clearly in the minority here, but I rise in opposition to Article 5. Although I'm all in favor of clean heat, um, unless we're all moving to clean heat, I find it fundamentally unfair that an owner of a new home will pay the same property taxes we all pay, but be prevented from choosing how to heat their home, same as we have that choice. If we want to make a move to clean heat, it needs to be done, I believe, more at the state level so that it applies across the entire state to make a difference. And if we ignore the unfairness that I find, my additional concern with this article is the waiver provision. I believe it's going to swallow the article um, in what we're looking to do. So I think that basically with this waiver position, uh, provision, the clean heat desire is just gonna be wishful thinking. So I would be in favor of an article for clean heat like this if it were more limited to commercial and non-owner occupied housing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Magliazzo. Um, Liebe Haim. Liba Hayam, Precinct 11. I move the question in all matters forward. Okay, very, thank you very much, Ms. Hayam. We have a motion to terminate debate. That's not debatable. So let's uh, get a voting screen up to terminate debate. 
Second, Mr. Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Fosca. So town meeting members, we have a motion to terminate debate on article five and a second voting will be enabled. At that point in time, you will navigate over to your voting portal. You hit refresh page or refresh screen and that should bring up your voting a one for yes, two for no, and three for abstain, and then hit cast your vote. Now remember, we only count yes and no votes. Uh, Ms. Wayman has raised the raised hand function on Zoom if you're having a voting issue. And if all else fails, please call um, Town Clerk Brazil at 781-316-3071. Um, and it looks like we don't have anybody in tech support right now, so we're not going to run into any issues right there. So go ahead and cast your vote. So we seem to be picking up the speed of voting. Everyone's kind of fallen into a good pattern. Um, maybe it's not going to take two minutes each time because right now we've already had 221 people voting and only 25 outstanding. Um, and Ms. Krause may still be experiencing issues. Mr. Moderator? Yes. Julie Brazil has her hand raised. Okay. We can assume when um, Julie raises her hand during voting that you can <laughs> just bring her up and um, activate her. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Moderator, Adele Krause, Precinct 6, votes yes. To terminate debate. Very good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we have 10 missing voters. Um, And I'm told Mr. McCabe has logged off. Um, so he's not in a queue anymore. So we have eight voters. Let's give them 15 seconds. Michael Brown, Patricia Costa, Annie LaCourt, Karen Kelleher, Robert Marlin, Sylvia Domin Dominguez, Leonard Carden. That is all six people can go ahead and vote. We're going to give you 10 seconds. I'm going to start my stopwatch because I don't have my nifty little clock. And five, three, two, one. Okay, let's close voting. Motion to terminate debate, it's two thirds. It passes 88%. We have 212 in the affirmative. 29 in the negative debate is terminated. That brings us to the vote on the main article. So once we run through the screens, um, I'm going to also assume that everybody has figured out where their name is and that they can find their name on their screen the first pass. If that's not the case, um, let me know. Okay, we're now going to take a vote on the main article on Article 5, Home Rule Legislation, Fossil Fuel Infrastructure. If you want to pass the bylaw and send it off to the legislature as a home rule, please vote yes once Mr. Karolski has finished his clicking. There we go. So your voting portal should be open at this point. Navigate back to the portal. Hit refresh if you need to. Vote one for yes, two for no three to abstain and then cast your vote. If you're having an issue, the raised hands feature will be opened. And Mr. Krowski, I'm gonna um, enter 
verbally entered votes for uh, Ms. Marie Kapelka. Ms. Kapelka votes no. And just a John Leonard. Mr. Leonard is voting yes. Mr. Moderator. Yes. We've got two hands raised. Okay. Adele Kraus and Janice Weber. Okay, let's take Adele. Yes. Ms. Kraus votes yes. Okay. So Adam, can we enter a uh, verbal vote for Ms. Kraus and Ms. Weaver? Mr. Moderator, um, could you uh, please say the uh, votes at the end of each um, article, if it's not too much trouble? Uh, yeah, declare what the vote is. Yes, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. That wasn't a voting issue, but I will do that. Uh, Beth Ann Friedman has her hand up. There's a problem with my voting screen. I vote yes, but okay. it's just thinking, thinking, thinking. So I, I think I have to reboot. Okay. The, um, yeah, with your permission, we'll enter, enter your vote as a yes vote. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Um, does Mr. Lobel have a point of order? And then Mr. Weinstein after Mr. Lobel. Hi, this is Josh Lobel, Precinct 8. Just very briefly, <clears throat> um, I know that uh, many people have to resort to the verbal vote, um, but I think it gives them undue influence in a way when you announce it, when the rest of our votes are not displayed. So I don't know if there's a, a way around that, but just something to consider. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Okay, so I'll, I'll try and wait to the very end of the vote before I do it, and then announce the two that I have. The others, I'm not sure what else we can do. We'll try that. Thank you. And Mr. Weinstein has his hand up. Yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jordan Weinstein, Precinct 21. I'm just reporting on behalf of Sylvia Dominguez, a town meeting member, that she's not been able to vote uh, using the uh, portal. Um, and doesn't seem to be able to raise her own hand. So. Um, if Ms. Dominguez could call the tech support people, yep. um, she can get their phone numbers on the get help button. Yep. Mr. Moderator, I just, yes, spoke, with, uh, I just spoke with uh, Sylvia and she's also. Okay, is she, do you think, is she able to vote? Yes. Okay, so we'll give Sylvia a moment to, to vote because she still hasn't voted yet. So Sylvia, if you can go ahead and vote, then we're gonna, um, Ann Fitzgerald, Michael Brown, Sylvia, and have not voted. So we'll wait, give those three folks a second. Mr. Moderator, Julie Brazil has her hand raised. Okay, Ms. Brazil. Julie Brazil, town clerk. I do have a vote for Ms. Fitzgerald whenever you're ready. We'll take her vote because I'm about to close voting. All right. Uh, Ann Fitzgerald, Precinct 17, votes yes. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Moderator, Phil has a point of order. Phil Goff. Okay. Mr. Goff, what's your point of order? And Sylvia has now voted. So Mr. Goff, what's your point of order? Uh, Phil Goff, Precinct 7. Uh, I'm just wondering, 
Mr. Moderator, for the sake of time, and I know this may not be the most popular suggestion, but for the sake of time, would it make sense for us to record the votes of those who are able to vote? And if the vote is close, we then take the time to go through and do all the verbal votes? Well, we would- If we, something passes by 90%, is it really worth all the time we're taking to make sure everyone, well, as important as it is, to register if, each vote? If, Thank you. We are gonna, we have to take everyone's vote before we close voting, because once we close voting, we can't go back in and manipulate the database and if they want to get their vote in. So I don't think it really takes that much time, but I understand your point. Um, we'll see how it progresses with the meeting. So let's close voting at this point. The motion carries by 93%. We have 225 in the affirmative, eight in the negative. And it's a vote and I so declare it. That ends article five. That will bring us to article six. Good, thank you, sir.